now, Mary. All right, darling. Have a good day. <laughs> well, a good morning, anyway. <laughs> there won't be much of it. By the time I've packed my few things together, they'll be passing around the glasses. You did say it was 12 o'clock, didn't you? Yes, at least those are my orders from Miss Harvey. You're sure you'll be able to make it? Of course, darling. I wouldn't miss your send-off for the world. They'll all be very disappointed. The day the BBC finally killed off Mrs. Dale, the radio soap queen, and her diary marked the end of another episode in the real-life drama of Jessie Matthews, the actress who specialised in putting on a brave face. I'm glad I put a little mascara on my eyelashes to prevent myself from crying. It's very sad, really. How long have you been in this? Uh, six years. Six years and a couple of months. Have you become Mrs. Dale? No. No, I'm afraid not. She's a very lovable, warm-hearted character. I like to think I am warm, but uh, I don't think I'm as good as Mary. Basically, you see, Jessie was an open-hearted, uh, uh, generous uh, disposition, but bedeviled all her life by a most complicated set of nervous disorders, which nearly wrecked her career on several occasions and resulted in the loss of friends and all society. She would change in front of you um, into a different person with whom you just could not communicate. There were no, no lines of communication left. It wasn't Jessie's fault, she was just unwell. Would you uh, go through it all again, the show business career? No, I mean? not for all the tea in China. Not for all the tea in China. You would not go on the stage? No. No, no, definitely no. When you're young, it's always spring, and life is a happy song. How we laugh at care, and sing as we roll along. Though the years go rushing by, and spring is a memory, life will always I came here, what, over 42 years ago, when this was Gainsborough Studios. This particular studio, Lime Grove, what is called Lime Grove, this is where Jessie did most of her big musicals. And, of course, arriving here is always a rather extraordinary feeling because of all the ghosts that have gone before. blinding star. Um, she's one of the most important stars we ever had. What is so extraordinary is that the majority of people today only think vaguely of somebody who was Mrs. Dale. It has something to do with the diary. Better dancer than Ginger Rogers, much, much better. And I thought a better actress. But she's rather forgotten, I'm afraid. And there isn't a plaque up to her. I think there's a plaque up to Jessie Matthews anyway. I don't think you, you can even find her gravestone. It's an oblivion entirely. Jessie would have loved it here. Oh, she would? Yes. 
Florence, I wonder, how do you remember where Jessie is? Well, it, it is it's sort of diagonal to someone with my Christian I name. See. I see, I see, yes, yes. Else. Two fans and friends of Jessie Matthews visit her unidentified grave. No. I have to look for Florence Bray and then, because some of these are new. Even for the poorest people in life, have something, um, somebody put That's something nice. up to say, of... well, they're resting here, but there's nothing at all, which is very sad. Yes, I, I well, I say, Jesse's m memorial is, uh, is the films that you people have in your cans. That's her memorial. You can get them out any time and, uh, and show them. I think that's more of Jesse. Put a bit of stone up or anything like that. It's only a few people know about it. No, I think she's got a memorial already. I can't find her. See Here we are. There she is. There I see, yes. 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 And that is how I know. It's this plot here along side there, really. Mm -hmm. there. Yes. Lovely. Fifty odd years ago, a star was born. The evergreen Jesse Matthews, this is your life. Before or since, in England, America, or anywhere, there's never been anyone quite the same. Jesse Matthews, who sang and danced her way from the back streets of Soho onto the front pages of the world. Over my shoulder go one care. Over my shoulder go two cares. Why should I cry through a part? I'm free at Glamour. But there wasn't very much glamour about the world that you were born into. No. Come in the stage of Irby. Free red pants, fresh every day. Five of pants, two of us. Every fresh every day. The great, incomparable C.B. Cochran. Now, if anyone had an eye for the germ of genius, it was he. In 1921, he writes, I was auditioning at the Palace Theatre when there came on stage a most interesting looking child called Jessie Matthews. She had enormous eyes, the funniest little nose, was wearing clothes that seemed too large for her and held in both hands a huge umbrella. She sang a little song and danced a little dance and was as attractive as could be. And Cochrane's wasn't the only eye you caught, as we can see and hear. Behind you now, some of the grind and some of the grief, the endless practicing, the trudging from agent to agent, striving to bury the Cockney accent that you've been brought up with. I'm never quite sure whether she was proud of having come from what they call nowhere, or a bit ashamed of, 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 of humble origins. It was a funny, there was a, a mixture of the two attitudes in it. In, in one way, she was. She would say, I used to dance there at Derrick Market on my father's fruit stall or something like that. At another time, she would uh, a little bit come the Duchess, uh, slightly plummy, and uh, oh no, they exaggerate all that. You know, you've got a bit of both. Yes, he lived down there over the stables that her father had, and it wasn't very nice. It used to smell the urine from the horses now and again as you were up there in the kitchen. Well, it was, it was just a one living room. It wasn't no kitchen, sitting room, nothing. It was just a living room. Did you think that Jessie Matthews would be a star? No way. For one thing, I thought perhaps the family wouldn't be able to afford it and the conditions that she was living in and things like that. I mean, you know, it didn't, it didn't seem possible that and looking back on it now, that she could have got so far for the little that she had. It was only sheer work and really hard work for her, actually. It really was. And then, of course, she had the opportunity to go to uh, America in the chorus, and she came back a star. So if I always knew my name was going to be up there in lights when I didn't know, but I knew. 
This used to cause an awful lot of atmosphere with the other chorus girls, because if they were at all unpleasant to me, I used to say, you're being very stupid, you know, because one day I'm going to be a star. She was born in Soho with a broad Cockney accent, but she did uh, take elocution lessons and to, to get the vowels right, but she went over the top. Instead of a normal voice, it was too terribly posh, or what we used to call cut glass. <laughs> and um, a lot of people impersonated her, you know. When uh, her number over my shoulder goes one care, you know, they would put up the nose like the Letusi nose and say, over my shoulder goes one care. And that is how she used to do it. <laughs> And she still stayed like that till, till the end of her days. She was a superstar. Uh, but she never had happiness. Thank I you. don't think she was really happy. I think she would have given it all up for a happy married life and have children of her own. I think she would have given all her stardom up for that. Honest? But I yeah. do, yes. Two ways about it. Do you think that's true, Doris? Well, that's what she told me in the latter years, you know. She said, we're well, looking back. I've had fame, fortune, I've been to places, I've met kings and queens. But when I think back, she said, and look at how happy the family is with their children and grandchildren around them. Mm -hmm. I would have loved that type of happiness. Jessie married three times and divorced three times. Her second husband, and the best known, was the musical comedy star Sonny Hale. Ironically, while she tarted up her vowels, Sonny, who came from a classy background, often found himself cast as a cockney. You drop this, miss. Oh, thanks. You won't forget to put me off at Linden Gardens, will you? No fear, miss. We mustn't keep auntie waiting, must we? Any more fares, please? She had a great capacity for marrying the wrong man. She had a genius for marrying the wrong man. Poor love, they're all so bloody to her. Forgive me, they behaved very badly to her, I thought. But I don't want the impression to, to emerge from what you're saying, Polly, that she was an unhappy person. She wasn't. She looked poorly in love. Yeah, well, she was physically unwell a well, good deal of the time. Well, because the doctors messed her about. And she lived on her nerves a great deal. Well, let me, all of us do, do anything but, in uh, life, don't we? She, she, she was very fulfilled in her work in Well, about that's the only thing she was fulfilled in, really. In the early 30s, Jessie hired a young Cambridge graduate to teach one of her brothers to be a gent. Frederick Jones, now Lord Elwyn Jones, later became Lord High Chancellor and protector of Jessie Matthews. Uh, she enjoyed enormously the work of an actress and did it superbly well. So I, I don't want an image to come of, 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 a, of a public figure living in a private state of depression. She was a very nervous person, very nervy person, but this, that's not the impression she's left on me, Polly. What's your difference, love? Well, of course we are. Um, she was very at ease with you. I didn't like to see this lovely girl. Lovely beyond words. You know, a dream, a dream. Lovely, she gave this impression of such beauty and floating about the place. Oh, she was a wonderful thought, dancer. We thought she didn't sing so well, but not that it mattered. But uh, I think she was a very emotional person and none of her marriages worked. They were all disastrous. And her great joy, obviously, her real life was with the audience, with the gallery, with the people who loved her, as it always is, you know, in cases like this. They, very often their private lives are impossible. But uh, they, they get their love from the audience, and that's where they belong. All right, let's go. One, two. Noon till night, nearly at night, here we pop over the top. Non-stop variety girls, whatever any impropriety girls. In 1927, the girl who looked out of place on the chorus line is out front, center stage, on her own. And 
1928, Jesse Matthews first to sing A Room with a View by Noel Coward. In 1929, Jesse Matthews first to sing Cole Porter's Let's Do It. 1930, Evergreen, the most lavish and sumptuous production Cochran ever put on the British stage, and at the top of the bill, you. When you put a little springtime in your heart. Four years later, Jesse made the screen version of Evergreen. It was a lavish production by British standards, which led to offers of work with Fred Astaire in Hollywood. Instead, at the height of her career, she took a year off to try to have a baby. As soon as she was pregnant, Jessie and Sonny spent a small fortune adding a nursery wing to their film star home in Hampton, Middlesex. But despite all the elaborate plans, things didn't work out. Very sweet. I was. I still am. Put me down, you stupid woman. <laughs> I don't like to be interfered with. Even then, look. <laughs> Was being adopted something that came as a bit of a shock? Yes, yes. I don't think it's uh, anything anyone expects, you know. How, um, did you, how did you find out? I was sent to boarding school when I was about seven or eight, when they were... She had come back from America and uh, was not at all well and wanted a divorce. And that was what was going on then. And so I was sent to boarding school, as it turned out. And I was told very swiftly there that I was adopted, which was a great surprise. By other girls, you mean? Yeah. Oh, yes. They were backward in coming forward, are they? And you, had you ever suspected? No. I used to think perhaps I was a bit unnatural, that I didn't, I didn't respond in the way I was obviously expected to. In what way? What um, with, I withdrew. You know, I didn't like to be clutched. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's a natural sort of um, reaction, I suppose. I don't know. I felt a bit alien, I think. Yes, I did. Everybody I met fell for her male or female, that knew her well, like I knew her. There was never any scandal of any kind on her side, but I admit people did fall for her, and she used to get very upset when her leading man on one occasion was quite besotted by her. And he was a very nice fellow, but he was married, and, uh, she said, what am I going to do? He's fallen for me and he's bothering me and worries me stiff. And I said, pretend you don't see it. Are you completely convinced that there was a relationship with Jessie and, oh, and yes. your husband? Oh, yes, completely. Why, isn't anybody else? I mean, the whole of London knew about it but me. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Did Sonny Hale know about the relationship, do you think? Yes, he did in the end. But um, I think he knew Jessie's faults and tolerated them, or knew her little... I mean, for instance, when we were having lunch one day, he said, you know, Jessie's a sucker for tall, dark and handsome men, which Harry was. He said she really swoons when she sees one standing on the street corner. And I think in a strange way, he was trying to warn me that um, she might fancy him, say fancy him, and maybe there'd be a mild flirtation during the run of the show. But I don't think he, he knew how devastating it would be to me and that it would be the end of my marriage. 
What a dreadful outfit, whatever is there. <laughs> <laughs> Much loved by everybody by the looks well, of the it. Well, the camera was rolling, don't forget. <laughs> it's a theatrical family. I'm not impressed. No, no. You will give me a hug. <laughs> she was very aware of the fact that she wasn't my real mother. Very conscious of it, I think. Whatever she said she was. And, um... I was always sort of saying she was going to give me back and that sort of thing if I didn't behave <laughs> which I thought might be quite nice <laughs> when our eldest daughter Jojo was a little girl we were living in the temple and Jessie had a little girl as you know this adopted child I said well bring her to tea let's have a children's tea party and she brought her and there was this little girl dressed most expensively I thought, well, poor duck, what's come over Jessie? She had pale pink silk dress and fancy shoes and everything. And I thought, well, somebody's selling these things to Jessie. You know, it's not how children should be dressed at that age. It wasn't a grand party, it was just tea and, tea and fun. And I realised suddenly that Jessie was a kind of victim. They knew she was earning a lot of money, so people who got things to sell used to persuade her that posh people or posh people's daughters, that's the way they ought to dress. I felt so. I didn't see this kid running around the garden, you know. In, in, in nothing or pants or something. Also, I think you may not agree, love, but I think she was a victim of doctors. She got iller and iller and pulled herself together and then married somebody else who was the wrong man again. Sustaining a long personal relationship, I think it was just not within her power. No, I th she wanted to be a star, she was a star, and I think uh, she was quite happy with that. What, what about her, her adopted daughter? Hmm, Catherine. Relationships were difficult, uh, but it was partly Catherine's fault and, uh, and partly Jess's fault. I mean, we, we all kid ourselves that we want certain things, or we say we want certain things. We don't really want them, do we? Uh, I mean, Jessie wanted to be a star, and she was a star. I don't think she was... I think she was too selfish to want anything else. You mean she didn't want to be a mother? But she, the romance of being a mother and the situation, the role-playing of being a mother probably appealed enormously, but I wouldn't have thought that. I mean, it was like she, she always had a little dog, for instance, a duck's dog, um, uh, and she loved having a pet, but if the pet wanted combing or looking after, Jessie wanted to have that on somebody else to do it. Throughout her career, Jessie suffered a series of mental breakdowns, but she still managed to keep working. She wasn't ill all the time. I mean, you know, she could go for months, then something would happen, and then the edifice would collapse. If she would turn on you, what would you do? One just rang her doctor, and somebody came round and looked after her. By the time I was seven or eight, which is young, they were divorcing and they'd gone, and the star was no longer quite in the ascendant, you see. We went to the war, and they both went their own separate ways, and uh, it was very different. I think she thought that after the war it would all be the same. Lots of us, most of us did. And that she'd step into her dancing shoes just as she'd done before, but she was older by six years. And times had changed, the musicals had changed, and things had come whizzing up in the middle of the war, which weren't anything to do with Jessie. I, there was no time for her, and she gradually drifted into oblivion. I think Jessie thought she was going back to be what she was before the war. She had overlooked the fact that she had put on a little weight round the hips. She wasn't quite the girl she had been. And she couldn't find a new personality to fit her appearance. But I think she was awfully hurt. And I think she thought that, uh, yes, I think she, she thought she'd been hard done by. And up to a point, it was true. 
the old girl's beginning to cry. In the wilderness years, Jessie found some work in Australia and South Africa, but there were hardly any offers back home in England. Hello. Lovely drying day. Don't you wish you could always get your washing fresh and white like this? Well, now you can. With Tide. The, people the star shines bright again. In the 60s, Jessie was in the limelight once more and earning good money. She had auditioned for the role of Mrs. Dale in the long-running radio series. When she got it, the old Jessie bounced back with a vengeance. I had just fixed an, an enormous commercial for her, which paid an awful lot of money. And we were driving down for a personal appearance somewhere, and she's passed a telephone box, and she said, Vincent, stop the car. I need to send a telegram to Brian Lewis, Brian's man she had been married to, and who she'd left behind in South Africa. And he thought, you know, there was no money left in Jessie. So the telegram she sent was, Dear Brian, just signed such and such contract. There's money in the old cow yet. Love, Jessie. We were traveling in my car, and uh, I turned to her. It was a very cold day. I turned to her and just put my hand on hers and said, Are you warm enough, darling? And she burst into tears. So I pulled up the car and I said, well, what on earth is the matter with you, Jess? And uh, she said, that is the very first time, in spite of having had three husbands, that anybody has ever taken the trouble to ask me if I'm comfortable. It's very sad, really, you know, and her life was bedeviled by that kind of thing. Someone said, resting on my knee. I think she was a di disillusioned with show business. And I don't know anything about show business, but I think I get to the point where she says that you have the adulation when she's done these concerts, but you still come back to her empty house. I think she envied, no, envy's not the word, but I think she envied sort of people who had families. It was basically what she wanted. In 1975, Jessie bought her last home, a three-bedroom semi in Hatch End. With the Dales long dead, she was once again unwanted, but not completely forgotten. If you met people and if you told them that your neighbour was Jessie Matthews, what was the reaction? Well, the older people were quite staggered. They used to ask me how I used to speak to her. And I said, well, I didn't curtsy. I just was normal with her. It's surprising a lot of people were quite surprised that she lived along here. A star living along, sort of, in a normal house. Did she expect the adulation to continue? I think she thought it always did. No, I don't think that worried her. Because um, even when she was no longer a big star, if you went into a restaurant with her, most of the men over 50 would stand up automatically and things like that. You know, she, she was still famous when she was no longer a star. When I mean a star is somebody who can sell seats. We had a mutual agent, Vincent Shaw, and he gave a champagne party for all his clients. And Jessie came in, and it was a very strange moment. We kissed. Uh, it wasn't one of those darling theatrical kisses, you know, which it doesn't mean a thing. It was, it meant something. And I was so overcome that I had actually kissed her after feeling rather bitter for many, many years. I had to leave the party. I, I couldn't believe it. I had to leave the party early. It was strange. We didn't speak. We didn't talk. We didn't talk about the old days or anything. It was just a genuine kiss of maybe forgiveness on my part and sorrow on hers, I don't know. How many but, years later was that? Oh, my goodness me, it must have been um, 30 years later. It was 
But then she still was Jessie. <laughs> she still dominated or still wanted to. Strange. She knew who she could do it with, and I think possibly Nancy was one and I was another. Uh, she would ring at 6.30 in the morning, she would ring at 2 o'clock the next morning uh, to chat. Uh, very often you would ring her at 1 o'clock in the afternoon and she'd say, I'm sorry, I'm having lunch, ring back later. <laughs> so it was a bit one-sided, but uh, yes, one was expected to be there. Did that happen to you? Yes, yes it did, often. Yes, I was in bed and she would say, um, I, will you come down? And I would say, well, Jessie, I'm in bed. Do come, darling. And so I used to get up, get in the car, and go down. But one did it quite, quite happily, really, you know. I mean, you might have thought, oh, bother, but uh, quite happily um, you would go, and uh, because you know that you knew that she needed you. I think you were very aware of what it meant to yes, her. Yes, yes, indeed. When yes. She needed you. Yes. Mm. How did she treat her friends? Don't know that she had many friends. A lot of people did a lot of things for her, didn't they? Yes, but uh, that, that always happens with a star, doesn't it? You get lots of little people around them, uh, you know, reflecting in the glory and living through them and things. And that's not really friendship, because when she ceased to be a star name, she was a very lonely lady. In Heathfield school days, I hated boys, those April Loveless joys. I read my Plato. Love I thought was sin. But since your kiss, I'm reading. She was staying with me in the country in Amsham. And one day she said, could I come over to the studios? I'd just like to go and have a smell of them again, you know, sniff around. So she came and I had to give her name in to the doorman always to say, oh, your guests were around, you know. And she was Mrs. Lewis. And um, I didn't say who else she was. I simply said, hey, Mrs. Lewis will be arriving after lunch. Will you see that she gets to stage three? So Mrs. Lewis came on, she was quite not, not enormously fat, but quite fat in those days. She'd put on weight. She came on, she looked exactly like Jessie anyway, and she sat, and I put her on one of the artist's chairs, and she sat on the edge of the light, watching the, 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 the shooting, you know. Nothing was said. So somebody, somebody came over and twigged her. And very gradually, it went through the whole of Pinewood Studios that Jessie had come back was on the floor and people came from every single stage most of them were old technicians who had worked in the days of Gainsborough or elsewhere at Elstree or wherever she worked and they all came to pay court and she had a group of about 50 people around her floods of tears of course <laughs> In January 1981, Jessie was admitted to St. Vincent's Hospital Pinner, unaware that she was dying of cancer. Officially, she was a national health patient, but still commanding star treatment. She had fads about food, certainly. Uh, when she was in here, I mean, there were certain things she liked and certain things she didn't like. And she always, she liked things like smoked salmon and things, you know, that, uh, not get? an everyday diet. <laughs> oh, well, the, that used to be brought in a street. I, uh, I remember anybody who came to see her knew, and they would bring her smoked salmon. Um, Anton Derlin brought her smoked salmon one day. He said, what would you like? And if anyone asked over the phone what she would like, the answer I had to give was smoked salmon. 
and smoked salmon, she got off. And Jessie rang me up afterwards and she said, Vincent, do you know that smoked salmon that Pat brought me? And I said, yes. She said, well, he told me it was a pound of smoked salmon and I had it weighed after he left and it was only three quarters. <laughs> was she serious then? Oh, very serious. Jessie would like, very always liked you to stay. She didn't want you to go home. She, you know, she would keep you. Getting away was very, very difficult. Oh, very we, difficult. We'd say we're going now. We can yes. just put that over there. Can you move that? Yes. Can we go now? You know, would you do that for me and would keep you mm. there for ages? Sometimes she really yes. didn't want you to go. Mm. I think perhaps fearing that it might be the last time. I think she went through a period where she was sure she would never sing again. That she had lost her voice. And we said, oh, no, you haven't. I'm sure if you try, you could sing. And so that's really why we brought in the just a little cassette recorder. And she sang into that. We've got a lady here who used to sing. Never know. It's all right, go on. The words don't matter. Go on. You went away. And my heart went with you. I speak your name in my every prayer If there is some other way To prove that I love you I swear I don't know how You'll never know if you don't know now You'll never know if you don't know. I wasn't surprised. She was a very, very sick woman, very ill when she made that last will. And uh, I, knew, I knew she'd done something. I saw her that day. I went up to see her and took her this real Barbara Cartland bed jacket, you know, all laces and ribbons, and she loved it, but she couldn't look at me, and I thought, you have been naughty. <laughs> uh, and so uh, when the will sort of came out, I knew that was, that was what it was, but it's fair comment. I was a disappointment to her, and um, she enjoyed my daughter so much, which pleased me, because I thought, well, at least, you know, you can have some pleasure there, which she did. But of course, I could control that. When I walk through the door, I don't now see her. I did perhaps for the first six months afterwards, but now I don't think of her in this room. I can think, I think of her away from the hospital, really, because she was basically, I know she had her sad moments, but she was very bubbly. You know? She was lovely. And each happy Over my shoulder goes it all. 